What's up, everybody? I'm Jason Weisenberg. And I'm Michael Weisenberg. Welcome to Vizland, Mikey. What's what's going on? How are you feeling? Who's um who's your favorite to win the circle? I have no favorite because I haven't watched enough episodes to realize who's in the finals. But well, on Netflix, uh, get on that. You can you can binge it before the finale on Wednesday. <laughs> Actually, on the first season of the circle, the one guy was a professional basketball player, quote unquote unquote, unquote. Yeah. Um spoiler alert, he doesn't win. <laughs> um, <laughs> Or come close to it for that. <laughs> they all think he's like a cat. He was an actual professional basketball player, yes, uh, that I'd never heard of. Well, he's better um, than the basketball player that was on at first sight. So if we're comparing, you know, reality TV. He was a better person at the very least. Right. So, you know, that, that definitely gets goes, goes, goes a decent way. But, know, these are the shows that I, I think everybody that watches Viseland or listens to Viseland would watch. Um, but nonetheless, I did get my second shot for the COVID vaccine. I hope that everybody else is getting their vaccines. And yes. uh, yeah, we're uh, kind of getting, moving towards the possibility of having like fans in the stands at the basketball games. Or yeah, at least fans in the stands in, at basketball in, or in Oregon, they just announced that the Blazers can have like 10% capacity. So yeah, know. but still not great. I know. And, I, uh, in LA, they're opening up the Lakers again too, and you're like, "Well, if you thought tickets were hard to get before, yeah, <laughs> limited to like ten percent, and then plus they want to do like the banner, you know, like hanging and all, all that." Stuff. Well, I think they want to do that as soon as they can have like a capacity. Okay, uh, well, I was like, if they if they do that now, it's like, and they only have like no twenty five hundred right. tickets or something. It's like I be, don't believe that's uh, going to be the case. I think yeah. it's I'm more on the side of close to full capacity at the very least. However, I will say that it's at least good to have some fans in the stands. Um, I was actually on the Trailcasters earlier with uh, Keith Fellner Smith and uh, Abdi Kualis Muhammad, and we were talking about the play-in tournament and how kind of like, it's a little messed up, man. Because like, do you know, you know how it works this year, right? Yeah, it's a, uh... It's so it's seven eight, seven, yeah, and they play, and the winner of that game gets a seven seed, like right off the bat. Crazy, like what? How many games are separating those two teams? So yeah, you got that. Then you've got the nine ten playing, and the winner of that gets to play whoever loses the seven eight game, and they have one game. Like it's not the two games you're you're in like it's not the double elimination and the advantage is home court advantage oh well that doesn't really work in the nba this year yeah and nor did it last year in the playoffs either but like no no but it, at least last year in the playoffs the blazers had to win one yeah to get in or the eight seed had to win one to get in and the nine seed would have had to have won two yeah that's not the case this year so yeah, man, like you're on pretty thin ice if you're like a seven seed and you lose, um, you could be out of the playoffs. Yeah, like, kind of, well, well, that's why with the Lakers possibly finding themselves very close to that territory. Uh, LeBron ain't, ain't too. The Blazers uh, finding themselves very no, close. The Blazers to that are territory. there at the second. <laughs> you know, if it ended, if it ended tonight, the Blazers actually have a harder schedule than the Lakers um, moving forward, at least in terms of uh, win loss ranking. But, but I just, uh, like, yeah, and they're, they're playing a bunch of teams that probably would rather play them than the Lakers in the first round. So I, I don't know, man. It's uh, it's it's a little scary for whatever team gets seventh place in either conference. Like uh, that's for sure. Yeah, they and uh, yeah, I just wanted to throw that out there. I do realize the hypocrisy of LeBron James. Yeah, that's what, that's that's my main takeaway. But. It was different last year. Like that, that, that was at least a different, a slightly different format. And I just think like the seven to 10, my, my idea is have the seven be safe, make it the nine, 10 play each other to play the eight seed. And then also make it the, the nine seed would need to win two and, um, or whoever the wins the nine, 10 game would need to win two and the eight seed would need to win one. Because I, I just think the single elimination stuff is like that. Like if you want, if you want it to be like 
uh, the oh, Euro League finals and everything like that, or like the NCAA tournament, that's one thing. But yeah, I just I, I think that's that's a little crazy. So I, I know baseball went to that, like in some of the th- like they have like the one game, which is also I think kind of terrible, honestly. <laughs> like, and again, like well, to me, like it, it's it throws out an entire regular season of work. I know Especially like, if the home field advantage or home like court advantage doesn't really mean that much. Yeah, I know they're trying to raise the stakes a little bit. To me, it's like I don't know. You get still yeah, stakes is high. Yeah, stakes is high. <laughs> you have a regular. Like, the word the day last soul. <laughs> even, even, even like with this shortened season, it's seventy two games. It's still like a pretty good body of work. I don't like. I don't know. I don't know if I'm pro. I mean, it's going to happen regardless of if I like it or not. But I'm not necessarily like super pro playing. Unless yeah, I, I I just I wonder how long this thing's going to work. Um, you know, not to mention the fact that it's like another game before the playoffs that where somebody could get hurt or no, totally. Like that. Which I, I like, yeah, like that um, is any game, I guess. But at the same time, yeah, I I don't love this format. I, I'll say that. Like, I don't really love it. I know there will probably be some really good games out of it, but I am, yeah, still, this, this format is brutal, man. Like the one game, like anything, can, like it's like the NCAA freaking tournament here. Oh, that, yeah, uh, that's, that's the whole thing. Like, playoff series. Like, There's this whole pace. Yeah, when a playoff series is like so different. Yeah. Yeah, you know each okay. yeah each game has its own yeah thing. I'm we'll we'll see, but obviously you know Luca and, and Mark Cuban both came out against it, even though it looks like well they're tied with the Lakers right now, and the Blazers are sitting like a game back right as of tonight of this recording but yeah it'd be interesting to see yeah. who ends up there I think they were a game back of the lakers half game back of dallas dallas has one of the easier remaining schedules as well um so yeah it's concerning for all of those teams and uh not to mention the eastern conference like you know you have i think like uh boston i think think is around the seven right now um miami's around there so yeah so if somebody gets like if there are injuries or anything like that then that could be the end of your season um yeah i i don't know i i think that not not to mention the other thing is remember they they had like uh the amount of games you needed to be close to the other team for that to even like yeah well that was the, well, that's, like, that's not the, that's not a thing anymore though, oh. because the, the 10 seed right now in uh, the West was four and a half games behind the seven seed. Like that, I oh, don't know, man, <laughs> Look, that's intense. Well, you're looking at the same in both conferences because it looks like the East as yeah. well. Like like Washington yeah, exactly. four games back of, of Boston. And that team could potentially like play the, the seven seed and get into the playoffs that way. See, I, yeah, I, I'd be more intrigued by the, uh, that like crazy idea of like having the, sh- the teams that don't make the playoffs, like play for like the first pick, but then some years that doesn't, yeah. Make, sense. Yeah, some, that doesn't make sense either. Like some years it does. Classic, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Some years you can vote it in, but some years you can, you can be all, all about it. Imagine the ratings of that tournament while the NBA playoffs is going on. Oh, no, no, totally. I know. It's like you kind of need to do that, like, European, where they kind of have those, like, sub-seasons within the season. You know, like, they have, like, they're longer, and then they have, like, UEFA or other, other things. But Sure. Transitioning. <laughs> We're going to talk about another time where the NBA was going through changes. And that was, um, I, what, I guess we can call the prep to pro era. And we define that era as being from 1995 to 2005. Um, and that, I think what really led the charge of high school players entering the NBA draft, because it hadn't been done in quite a while. Like, I guess Sean Kemp, is somebody who usually is classified as uh, having entered out of high school, but he did spend some time at junior college. Um, But yeah, like it hadn't been done since uh, I think like uh, it was like only a few guys had ever done it. Moses Malone Malone. and Bill Willoughby. Um, Willoughby, as I should say. Um, But yeah, 
so what led to this charge was the introduction of guaranteed rookie contracts. Because before 1995, whoever was the first pick in the NBA draft, this was like a whole new world of NBA contracts just in general. And whoever was the first pick in the NBA draft would ask for, at the time, what was considered like astronomical money. Um, I remember them making like a huge deal, like the media and everybody making a big deal about Glenn Big Dog Robinson in 1994 coming in to Milwaukee and asking for a $100 million contract because that had never been done before. And I'm guessing he signed like one of the richest deals in NBA history up to that point. So the owners said, hey, like, you know, we're having to pay tons of money to players we just drafted. Why don't we make these guaranteed rookie contracts? Uh, the thing they forgot to put in the first time also was the restricted free agency. That was something that got added on a little later. But very luckily, like many of these teams ended up signing these players and not losing them. But um, there were a few teams that definitely like lost players early on because they could go wherever they wanted after their three-year NBA rookie contract was up. So the introduction of these rookie contracts leads to Kevin Garnett entering the NBA draft. Of course, there were other factors as well. Um, but yes, we want to go over the top 10 players who entered the NBA out of high school from 1995 to 2005. Um, we do realize there have been like some players who entered post-grad and everything since, but yeah, we're just going to go over the one in, or the prep to pro era and um, look at the 10 best who entered the NBA over that era. No, definitely. And it was a good, it was a good draft era. You know, it like, was, it was a good era in terms of like the players that were um, picked we'll see that it was kind of an interesting era in terms of like how they valued these players and um, where these players like ended up getting picked in comparison to with where they ended up like in terms of that actual draft. And uh, I think that at least the first number of years, like they didn't really know what to do with these guys like uh, entering the league and they went severely underdrafted and then after a little while, they may have gone a little bit too high. And uh, then they went back to a lot of players that were underdrafted once again. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of it was based on the player. But um, we're going to go in reverse order and go over our top 10 prep to pros from 1995 to 2005 NBA draft. Let's do it, starting with number 10. Starting with number 10, and this one was really tough. Um, there were a few really good choices. I went with the longevity here, and this is just a player who I think uh, not only is he an interesting story just in terms of how everything turned out for him as far as his NBA career uh, went, but he um, he's also like a role that – Every year, people are like, I think this guy can do what this guy does. And so few people do. And that is Lou Williams. And Lou Williams has spent um, like almost his entire career coming off the bench. Out of 1,061 career games, he started 122. But the thing that he does off of the bench is create offense. Like he's a microwave scorer and a movement shooter and not only that but like you know a pull-up shooter he can create his own shot he can create offense for a bench unit um he really like raises bench units in terms of, of offensive creation and that's lou williams and lou williams went to um south Gwinnett high school in georgia he was considered one of the, the top players. I think he was actually at a time might have even like been considering going to University of Georgia, decides to enter the NBA during that last year uh, where prep to pro was uh, went down before they changed the age limit in the year 2006. And then him being that in the second round too, I'm pretty sure he was the last one pick. Was he the last prep to, uh, prep to pro drafted? 
Yeah, because like, he was he was forty fifth pick in that draft. Yeah. Um, let me check. No, Andre Blatch. No. Uh, I think there might have been. Oh yeah, Amir Johnson also. Oh yeah, okay. You're a little wrong there, but you were close. He's the only one we care he, was, about. he was he was one of the last. The last one we cared um, about. that was drafted. The amazing thing with him here is that he is. There are only two players who have played in the NBA every season up to this point from that draft, and it is Lou Williams and Chris Paul. That's it. Like, so pretty amazing in terms of longevity. And I think he's also, yes, he is the second leading um, in career points from the uh, 2005 NBA draft. Needless to say, as of the 45th pick, he was severely underdrafted and uh, definitely well surpassed <laughs> yeah, where three, Philadelphia three ended up. The year. I mean, he had some all-star buzz a couple of those years with the Clippers too, because he was getting over 20, 20 points a game. I think yeah. 16 and 17, 18. But just a, it feels like a, a really nice role. Um, just kind of like that combo guard, but it's score. The, that's the big thing with him. And that level of scoring, the level of ability to create space, separation, uh, get to the basket, get to the free throw line, um, have, you know, range as well. He um, really like shifted out a niche and has become like an endless draft comparison for small microwave scoring guards. Um, oh, yeah, he's so, definitely, he's yeah I, I think he, uh, yeah, he, he's, he's like created like, yeah, well, did, I, I think that archetype already existed. It existed but I but mean, he's he, like the current definition of it. He was a, a prototype of yeah. said archetype. And uh, yeah, like, you know, if I, the amount of times I've heard, oh, I think he could be like a Lou Williams type player. And uh, that I, I just don't think is as common as one would believe, which is why Lou Williams has been at that role and uh, been successful at it for as long as he has. Has yeah. as won as many six man of the years as he did, and still and still going. You know, like he is, he is, and uh, yeah, it does appear that Father Time may be catching up with him to an extent, but yeah, still is uh, playing like rotation minutes at this point. And we'll see what you know back back home in Atlanta. We'll see how that that does for him with the yeah. Hawks. But yeah, it's like he's you know you look at the trajectory too. It's like a at that, you know, there's been a mix of like some of the high school guys don't get to play as much those first couple of years. And you can see that in his career as well. He doesn't get like that much playing time, year one, year two, and then it just takes off. For sure. Yeah. That, that was the thing with high school players. And I, like, I think one of the, the major things was that it would usually take that year for them to get adjusted. And, um, yeah, I, I think that NBA teams, like just the, the margin of for error on the high school players was, I think, pretty high. Um, at the same time, would, like, would I be fine with them having that change? I think we have so much more data and so much more information on high school players now than we did back in 2005 and, you know, like, the EYBL and uh, the shoe circuits, like you know Adidas, and there's more preparation for them as well now. Like that, like, that as well. And uh, yeah, like I, I, I don't. It doesn't seem like they're revisit revisiting uh, Prep to Pro as much as they had talked about a possible double draft in 2022. Um, that still has yet to be ironed out, and I don't think it's in the cards for the next little while. Uh, I think they're happy with the G League Ignite program and with everything that's been going on and um, with new possible pre-draft pathways besides the NCAA. But um, yeah, I, I, it's something I'd be willing to revisit. It is uh, really cool that Lou Williams is like the last of these kind of uh, prep to pro guys floating around from that particular draft that had a, a number of them in 2005. And um, he was 
fifth in the RSCI. So yeah, it it honestly like it wasn't a class that was like killing it. I I would say, but yeah, like there there were definitely some players drafted in front of him. You had like you know Andrew Bynum, uh, who was somebody I consider putting on this list. Has a couple championship trophies and made an All Star team. But yeah, I, I went with Lou Williams in terms of his longevity. Uh, Martel Webster was actually the first high school player selected in 2005. He was the sixth pick. Uh, the Blazers trading back and uh, passing up on a chance to draft Darren Williams and uh, Chris Paul. Just saying. Because <laughs> it's good Blazers. But you don't know, like, again, okay, Martel Webster, uh, like, a lot of injuries played it, played in there, but obviously yeah. he was already gone for the Blazers. But yes, I would have very much liked either, either one. But move, moving on, number nine, we got Rashard Lewis. Yes. And that was it, like the draft story of Richard Lewis was like really sad. Like that, that was the ultimate moment of him being like the last person left in the green room. And uh, he was number two in the RSCI, um, went to, I hope I'm not butchering this, but Elif Elsick High School in Texas. Um, and he, is another guy who I just feel like became kind of like this archetype of the the stretch four, especially the like the three point specialist. Um, yeah, I it's hard to call him three and D because like yeah, I don't he, think he was, he was like, ever really known for his defense. But I think again, it's like that 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 six ten size, but not being yeah. a post player. You know, like that like more. Oh, for sure, up. for sure, and but, yeah, like face up four. Um, I think I think even like considered it at a time to be like a combo forward, and he um, had played in the hoop summit. He he actually played it against Dirk Nowitzki. He and Al Harrington, I think, were like the two leading scorers for the USA in that game. In what was like a really close game as well, and um, Richard Al Harrington ends up going um, pretty high in that or higher than Richard. Uh, he was, Al Harrington was the RSCI um, number one player in that uh, 1998 NBA draft. He goes 25th to Atlanta, or to Indiana, I'm sorry. And um, Richard Lewis goes 32. He, go, he slips to the second round and he is crying in the green room. And like, he basically when when he's interviewed is like saying how he's like going the other teams are going to regret passing up on him and i i think they really did um he does get off to a bit of a slow start in seattle but by that next year he's gained rotation minutes and then he is a like flat out starter um by his third season and has a, a few really good seasons there with seattle he makes his first all-star team in 2004, 2005. Um, that's the first season he averages 20 points per game. He has three seasons in a row where he does that. And then he signs a fat contract to be kind of like the second banana to Dwight Howard in Orlando. Um, and obviously Orlando, like when they do make it to the NBA finals, they have Hito Turkoglu, they have Jameer Nelson, like a, a nice roster. But Richard that season was like that. That was the season where he led the NBA in three point attempts and three pointers made. Um, actually, making even more three pointers the season before in Orlando as well, just not leading the league, I suppose. But also like shooting around forty percent from three. Yeah. The guy was like a flamethrower um as we i was when i was talking to jason about the list he does win an nba championship on his way out also yeah he doesn't have like a huge role on the miami but he wins with the 2012 2013 miami heat um gets his ring and then that next year is playing on miami when they make the nba finals as well uh before he retires but yeah, he was somebody who was definitely like quite underdrafted. And I think if you do like a 1998 redraft, Richard is certainly like at least around the halfway point of the lottery. 
And the other crazy thing about that draft was Houston has three first round picks and Richard Lewis was a Houston guy, like, you know, was from Houston and Houston takes Michael Dickerson at number 14. From Arizona. Bryce Drew. Yeah. Bryce Drew at number 16 from Valparaiso and Mirsad Turkon. And uh, I don't know if this is just something I'm kind of remembering from a magazine or, or something like that, but uh, they, the, I remember hearing like, oh, Houston said he was our fourth choice. And uh, yeah, that was, uh, I, I think a, a bit of a blunder by the hometown Rockets to uh, not take Richard Lewis, who has a very nice NBA career. Yeah, would have been good on those those Houston Houston teams. Well, I guess pre pre T Mac and because they they flip Michael Dickerson for he's part of the Steve Francis trade. I think he ends up in Vancouver. Really, but yeah, Richard Richard Lewis is one of those those guys. It's like he was a little bit ahead of ahead of his time in his style. Like it would have been, you know, well served right now in, in the in the NBA as one of again like yeah. a big face up shooter. Oh, I like a guy who I don't even think it would have been a question if he was uh, a three or a four, like he would be that stretch four guy. And unfortunately, no more Seattle Supersonics. And that's the, the other sad thing. When you look at his his career, there's there's no more Seattle for now. Requiem for a team. They're, they're, they're coming back. They're coming back one day. Moving on to number eight, we have Tyson Chandler, Compton Dominguez High School in the greater Los Angeles area. He's a guy, I just got to say, I remember the first time ever hearing about him. I think he was on 60 Minutes. I remember <laughs> reading a magazine where they were talking about him as like a ninth grader. Yeah, he yeah. Was like, I remember a 60 Minutes piece on him and he literally just had that like bucket of just mail that he got from like every college on the planet. For sure. You know, it's, it's, he was, I think he was six foot 10 when he was in ninth grade. Um, yeah, like on the radar very early on, a guy who was just, you know, ended up being seven feet, seven foot one, very athletic. And uh, yeah, they just was really able to move in uh, a pretty amazing way as well. And um, he ends up being the RSCI number four player in his class. And the RSCI number one player in that class was Eddie Curry. And Tyson Chandler still goes number two. And uh, Kwame Brown, who was the RSCI number six player, ends up being the number one pick in the draft. The rumor was that there was a workout. This was at a time where I guess you know, players would also still work out against each other, especially if, you know, you're a high school player, I guess you had something to prove. And Tyson Chandler gets a limousine sent to pick him up and uh, Kwame has to take like a taxi and like there's like a whole story about like uh, Tyson Chandler gets like a, um, a great like ribeye steak and Kwame gets like, a, you know, rump roast, like it's all this all these th things leading up to the fact that Kwame Brown apparently whoops Tyson Chandler in this workout that they have for Washington that really impresses Michael Jordan. Um, it does not end up working that way in the NBA. And uh, I would say from that 2001 draft, Tyson Chandler definitely becomes the best high school player from said draft. And that, and that was the first draft to Kwame, you know, that that's your jeopardy answer is he's that first high school guy to go go number one you pick number one you, have, you know Chandler two and then you had Pow at international three but then you have Eddie Curry like this was the first like really like high school at the very top of the lot like the lottery draft Tyson Chandler was the first high school player going number two that's another and then he ends up he ends up with Eddie Curry and he got he uh gets traded to the Bulls where they I guess were thinking of a twin tower situation uh, but yeah, gets traded to the uh, Chicago Bulls for Elton Brand from the LA Clippers, who were his hometown team that drafted him. He played at Compton Dominguez High School. Um, and he 
like I, I don't think he ever like really found his like footing in Chicago. I don't know. Like I guess he played all right. They were still with the, they were still um, like a re, a total rebuild mode, and it's like they kind of towards the, the end of his tenure were like close to the playoffs, like okay, sort of, sort but of. never, yeah, never like, yeah, had any. But he, where he really starts to get going is on New Orleans. And then I remember at one point, New Orleans tries to trade him to Oklahoma City. And Oklahoma City refuses it based on medicals. And like, you were like, kind of wondering, like, is Tyson Chandler done? And it turns out, no, not at all. He ends up going to Dallas, where he only spends one season. But it's a hell of a season. <laughs> And he plays a hell of a role. And he he's really the defensive anchor on that 2011 Dallas NBA championship team. Um, I think like, you know, of course you remember Dirk Nowitzki, you remember Jason Kidd, Jason Terry. Um, Sean Marion, of course, was on that team as well. The thing that I think LeBron James and a lot of the Miami Heat remember is Tyson Chandler being in the paint and them being afraid to drive to the basket, knowing that he would be there like, you know, for the weak side block shot or for the contest. He was fantastic on the defensive end during that playoffs and series. And then he does eventually win uh, the defensive player of the year when he and was with the next year when he goes on the Knicks, yeah. Yeah. And he makes an, and he, an, all-star, he team. Makes an all-star team in 2013 as well. And he also um, doesn't remember, but I saw him at New York Fashion Night in yeah. uh, 2013. So, and he also makes the All NBA third team in 2011 12 when he wins the Defensive Player of the Year as well. Um, yeah, so he has a, a nice little stretch there where he's super impactful. And um, yeah, he, he even goes back to Dallas and does well there also. And up until last year, he was, he was still in the NBA. Um, but yeah, long career for Tyson Chandler and, uh, just a really good, like, uh, basically defender Interior protector, yeah. providing like rim protector, but just providing versatility as a defender and, um, was a huge lob threat. No, so, definitely. yeah. Was someone, yeah, was, slow, slow start, but ended, ended up, yeah, super, super yeah. strong. And then speaking of that, a few years with like absurd offensive ratings as well. And then speaking of starting starting off slow, we have number seven. We have Jermaine O'Neal from Eau Claire High School in South Carolina, and he's someone that had the unfortunate, I guess, situation of being drafted by the Blazers, first pick, seventeenth yeah. overall. And like this was at a weird time in the in the history of the Blazers. I think we had. There's a lot of people on that roster. It was pretty bloated in some areas, especially with players you were paying lots of money to. And Jermaine O'Neal really on the, on the Blazers does not get much of an opportunity, period. I mean, I think we saw him in a few games that I don't remember him ever really playing more than a couple minutes. Did you know that Jermaine O'Neal, according to this list that I have here, I think it's spot track, um, is the 38th highest paid NBA player of all time, just in terms of salary. Well, yeah, once he, once he, once he moves on, because then as soon as, so the Blazers after 99, 2000, they make a swap for him. He goes to Indiana for Dale Davis, goes to Portland. And, you know, Jordan has his first real year where he's, I mean, he plays 81 games, starts 80, getting 12.9 points a game. But then that next year, he's up at that 19 point a game mark and he makes all-star teams for the next few years. Yeah. So he did start off slowly. What I will also say is he was like kind of thrown into a really deep, like in talented Blazers team and like stacked front court. Oh yeah, he had like um, you had Brian Grant, you had Sean Kent, you had Rashid. Like yeah. there's a lot of guys there, so it's not like there was there was much opportunity. But yeah, and he was really young. That that was the other thing with Jermaine O'Neal. 
Um, at the he, time, he was the youngest player to play in the NBA because he was still yeah. like 17. Kobe, you know, yeah, he was. He was and he older. he was a little young, like he was, I think, 19 days younger than Kobe Bryant, like something like that, where they had really similar birthdays. Um, yeah, Jermaine was born in uh, October 1978. But yeah, they they were pretty close in terms of um, how old they were, like playing their first NBA game. And um, he does, so yeah, he really finds himself once he gets to Indiana. Um, he gets to Indiana in that first year, they, oh, okay. So he gets to them like right when, after they had made the NBA finals. Yeah. and they lose in the first round. Um, but yeah, eventually becomes like a, a contributor on like a conference finals team. He uh, even has a year where he, I believe he finished third in MVP voting. He's three, three time all NBA. Yeah. I think he had a year where he finished like, um, yeah, so in 2003, 2004, which is, I, I think, the year that they uh, end up making the conference finals. He gets a couple first place MVP votes from Kevin, uh, the year where Kevin Garnett wins his lone MVP. Um, what the hell? <laughs> That's so weird. <laughs> yeah, Kevin Garnett definitely deserved MVP that year. But yeah, Jermaine O'Neal finishes third behind Kevin Garnett and Tim Duncan. Uh, gets a couple first place votes. The other first place vote that year goes to Peja Stojakovic, who finishes in fourth in MVP voting. Um, yeah, wow. But yeah, Jermaine O'Neal is just this power forward center, m mainly center, and just could kind of do like a, a little bit of everything. Uh, could, you know, stretch the floor a little bit, not, I wouldn't say out to three point range as, uh, I, yeah, he makes uh, 14 three pointers over his. Yeah, yeah he was a, he was more a post kind of kind of guy. For sure, for sure. But I think like in like the modern game, he probably would be taking them and uh, like could certainly like stretch it a little bit. You could do quite a few things on uh, on offense. Was a always a really good rebounder. Uh, provided some rim protection as well. Does lead the NBA in block shots his first year in Indiana once he gets out of uh, Portland. And um, yeah, he is just, uh, has like a, a really nice peak. I think injuries kind of played the the downfall of him like past, uh, I, I think like, yeah, like he hits 32 pretty hard. But um, yeah, really good career for Jermaine O'Neal. Drafted into a situation where it was rough to get playing time, but always showed flashes and was certainly like a really talented player. And I think uh, Portland more than likely regretted that trade pretty heavily. Yeah, because because I mean, Dale Davis was one of the getting paid a lot of money. And I remember he used to come in every game with a very big smile on his face knowing that he is getting paid a ton. <laughs> And yeah, not playing at the same level that Jermaine O'Neal was. So it's yeah, like, and it's well, and then I think like after they trade Jermaine O'Neal, they have a few years where they, because they had made it to the the Western Conference Final that year before, and they have a few years where they just like lose in the first round a bunch of times, or like I think maybe the playoff streak like ends, it comes to an end as well. Um, yeah, wasn't the best, and. I think you put Jermaine O'Neal like in terms of that draft, he, he ends up being the 17th pick. You would likely have him, he would at least be in the lottery of that like ridiculously stacked. Well, that's, yeah, this is like one of the strongest drafts of all, of all if time. You, if you did like a redraft, he would likely be like at least like 10 spots higher than what he was ended up uh, being drafted. But uh, yeah, I, I think in most years, you would be pretty happy if Jermaine O'Neal was like the, you know, fifth, seventh pick in your NBA draft. Um, you'd be, I think, really happy. But um, yeah, that's uh, Jermaine O'Neal and uh, was the youngest player to have ever played an NBA game up until Andrew Bynum comes into the league.
And now Jermaine O'Neal is tearing it up as an agent. He and another prep to progress yes. get into later. Start an agency. We'll with Drive time. Nation for a number of years, uh, AU, AUYBL team out of uh, Texas. But yeah, he's an agent now. And then next we got number six, Amari Sodomer, Cypress Creek High School, Florida. This was someone who came in the league pretty, pretty grown. <laughs> like he was pretty, you know, he didn't, you know, have to do like the whole adding, like obviously he did add in the weight room, but like he was already a pretty grown individual. Like he looked like a, a man coming straight into the league. Like Jermaine O'Neal was a little skinnier. Some of the other guys, you could tell they took them a little time to develop. Amari really came in pretty, pretty strong out the gate. And I believe he's the first high school that NBA got player to win rookie of the year. Yes, he is. And the other thing with Amari Stunmer, he was number one in the RSCI. He um, attended but did not play. It. Uh, oh, so he goes to five high schools. Yeah. So there, there was a school he attended and didn't play, but goes to five different high schools. Um, the rumor with Amari Stoudemire, like I think the first time I ever heard about him was he was considering entering the NBA draft as a junior in high school. However, I do think he was a little older for class. So like that may have just involved him reclassifying. He does end up uh, like playing his first game in the NBA at the age of um, 20. So yeah, he was already like, had turned, I think it turned 20 or was like late 19. Like, by one, the time like, like, like a couple weeks into the season because yeah. they don't have a birthday, October, October yeah. start. So, you know, again, like for a high school kid, I mean, 20 is pretty old. Like, yes. I was 17 uh, <laughs> when I finished high school, but you know, like. Amari Sotomar, like when he was at his peak and I, I think the selling point on him even so was that he was just a tremendous offensive talent. He was really like a great athlete, uh, could finish above the rim, could stretch it out a little bit as well, um, had some ball skills and fantastic cutter, was lob threat. Yeah, the guy like could get buckets at an unreal rate um, when he was in his prime and at his best and did that as soon as he came into the NBA. Yeah, and like he really, he got that click with Steve Nash on that high pick and roll. And that was just like what made that run and gun Phoenix Suns team, which is why Amare, as of today, is an assistant over there with Steve Nash on Brooklyn because they really like, they really clicked off on that pretty, pretty well. Yeah. And I remember like, his first his first playoffs. I remember him like taking it to. I know there's like one where he like took it and he like dumped on Yao Ming. Yeah, he um, has a really nice stretch where he makes all NBA teams like on a pretty consistent basis. Um, was all NBA first team in 2007. Was second team in 2005, 2008, 2010, and 2011. And then, and, uh, and, that, and that was after he had suffered like a, an injury where he was basically uh, limited to only three games during this. Yeah, that micro fracture, which at the time was a very like a year long injury that not a lot of people had and successfully come back from. Yeah. That well. So, yeah, it was. That it, was takes, it takes him a year and then he's like pretty much back to where he was before. Um, and yeah, he was. A lot of fun on those Phoenix teams. He comes into New York and is putting up huge numbers as well. And uh, I think injuries eventually catch up with him to at least some extent. And uh, yeah, he um, plays his last season in 2016. Um, but then he was, go to Israel. Yeah, he played in Israel until this past season. <laughs> you know, this was his first season back in the US and, and, and coaching. But yeah, no, Mari was like, Definitely one of the better power forwards of that that era. Yeah, like another one of those four or five combo kind of guys. And um, yeah, somebody you wouldn't even mind like at that size playing the power forward. But yeah, in the, in the modern game, I think he would be a fantastic center. 
Yeah, today I think is yeah, like straight straight center because again, like not a lot of ton of outside shooting, but just like the ability to attack the basket with his strength was was pretty pretty off. He was reckless, man. Yeah, he, he was, was just a, he was a bad guy. Like he was just, Gosh. and then like with with yeah, Steve Nash and that kind of open open offense, you know, just left him for a lot of a lot of super good opportunities. Yeah, huge huge reason you know um, Phoenix almost got over the top and in a few of those years they were a tough tough out but number five we have dwight howard southwest atlanta christian academy guess what yeah. state that's in georgia so dwight you know 2004 number one pick and this was like the biggest high school draft of drafts yeah you had a lot of you had a lot of guys in this in this draft um i believe there were eight selected in the first round and uh yeah it was a really stacked high school class you have dwight howard going one you have sean livingston going four people thought who people thought could have been the best in the, in the class as well uh i think dwight howard was yeah, Dwight was the number one pick for sure. Sure, yeah. well, people like like sean livingston a lot and unfortunately yeah. injury there like derailed didn't he, like stop his career but really took it in a different trajectory and luckily he was able to Rebounding and continue it, but again, not at the same pace he probably envisioned. Yeah. Robert Swift at number 12, Sebastian Telfair at number 13, Al Jefferson, number 15, Josh Smith at number 17. I remember Jay Billis saying that he thought Josh Smith was going to be a bust in on live television and uh, with the announcers like blaring in the arena, um, which I thought was kind of messed up. And then uh, J.R. Smith at number 18 and Darrell Wright at number 19. So yeah, eight high school players taken in the first 19 picks. Yeah. Fantastic class. Yeah. And was, most of them end up being really good players as well. Like Robert Smith, Robert Swift ends up kind of flaming out. Sebastian Telfair doesn't have as long as a, of a career as you would have uh, likely hoped for, but yeah, a lot of really good high school players there. And um, yes, you have Dwight Howard, who for a long time, I think was considered the best center in the NBA um, and does lead a team to the NBA finals very early on in, in his career. Um, he gets there by his fifth season when Orlando loses in five to the Los Angeles Lakers. Um, and they never really get back there uh, but the year after they make the NBA finals, um, or was it two years? No, two years after they make the NBA finals. Oh, okay. So they make it back to the Eastern conference finals that next year. They make, um, or Dwight Howard in 2011, uh, cause I think that was after they had I think lost like most of their big names. And he um, does finish second in MVP voting with John Hollinger. I remember making like an impassioned statement of Dwight Howard winning the MVP over Derrick Rose when let's just be real. It should have gone to LeBron James if, <laughs> if we weren't playing narratives and weren't upset with him going to Miami and, all that stuff. Uh, well, yeah, it was a Nike thing, I guess. You know, he was he was going that direction. But you know, Dwight, Dwight, like for his peak years in Orlando, yeah, like was the better center. You know, like one because I mean, Shaq yeah. at that point was done more yeah. or less. And Dwight Howard plays on a um, so he plays for Southwest Atlanta Christian Academy. He also plays for the Atlanta Celtics, who have a front court of Dwight Howard, Josh Smith, and Randolph Morris, all of whom were over six foot 10. I can't imagine a, that being a fun high yeah, school. With, with that, with, yeah, with that, like with that uh, athleticism. That I they... think Javaris Crittenton might've been like in the fold as well. And yeah, like that is a monster. Of yeah, an he's a, he was a bigger, you know, guard uh, himself. I also remember it being kind of like a question of who was going to go number one in that draft between Dwight Howard and Emeka Okafor. And Emeka Okafor was 
um, I think it won just about every national player of the year award was considered a, you know, good at a lot of the same things Dwight Howard was, was not the level of athlete that Dwight Howard was. And, uh, but still like, I think really similar in terms of like measurements and length and everything like that. But yeah, Orlando makes the absolute right choice. Yeah. But I think, uh, yeah, similar, similar, to, similar thought in what you were getting, you know, that kind of, kind of player, but yeah, Dwight Howard, obviously. That and the him. other funny thing is that I think Emeka Okafor still does win rookie of the year. But Dwight Howard comes into the NBA and immediately averages a double double, uh, which is pretty amazing for a player that was coming in out of high school at the time, and um, is one of the better rebounders I think in NBA history. Is uh, a defensive anchor for a really long time in Orlando. I think after Orlando is when things kind of, you know, are. are at least sort of questioned. And his, year, his year with the Lakers definitely does not go as, as planned. You know, no. break a lot of that up. <laughs> and then his leaving the Lakers that next year in free agency also does not, you know, greet him with a lot of fanfare and love. Yeah. But yeah, still like five times he's led the, he led the NBA in rebounds per game, including his first year with the Lakers. And um, then, yeah, he's just, like been this absolute like monster in the post. Um, one of the NBA dunk leaders of all time, uh, won dunk contests, of course. He is uh, yeah, just like a, I, I would say like a classic center. I know that people like kind of compared him to like Tim Duncan and like other things at the time, but he never really gets that point of uh, yeah. offensive game. And I know he works with Hakeem Olajuwon on post moves and everything like that, but didn't really have that that level of agility. The thing that always amazed me with Dwight was that he never averaged more than 13.4 field goal attempts per game. And yes, he gets fouled at like an absurd rate for a long time. And um, so like huge free throw attempts. But I feel like, you know, Shaquille O'Neal was getting fouled and still putting up like 18 to 20 shots per game. Uh, which is always something that you you kind of wish like Dwight could be more of that offensive hub, but never was really that. Um, but still has like a number of really strong years, um, and like is I, I would say one of like considered one of the NBA's best defensive players over a pretty uh, long period of time, and, and wins three straight Defensive Player of the Year awards from. 2009 to 2011 uh, is a multiple time NBA all-star as well. Um, but yeah, I think uh, later on in his career, he's just like kind of plays this role where you bring him in for defense rebounding and for pissing other people off. Yeah. Just <laughs> and, uh, even, even infuriating person. And again, he's going to leave, you know, his career with that, the one championship on his resume, who knows what happens. Is. With yeah. Billy. But, and honestly, like, played a pretty, like, key role, I would say, like, over the season, first off. And then um, he's really used in just, like, two series. And uh, I think they realize, like, early on it's not going to work versus Miami. But he's used in Denver and does a good job defending Nikola Jokic and then uh, did a good job at, like, just annoying the hell out of people in the Portland series. Uh, but yes, Dwight Howard does finally win that NBA championship ring last year and has, I, I would say, like played a pretty good role for Philadelphia this year. Um, but yes, I think that you you could probably, there, there may be some that would argue for him being higher. I think he is a Hall of Fame player as well, um, based on everything he's achieved. But he, um, I don't think you can put him higher than this like yeah i think, I, I think I, i'm sure that some will argue but yeah I, I don't think you can when you when you look at like tiers you know again of like breaking things down it's like i think after dwight howard here we're reaching this this other tier of yeah. you know. and the other thing i will say is that he um is i would say absolutely the player that you take number one in uh 2004 nba redraft yeah, the only player I think who would even come close would be Andre Iguodala, and I think Dwight Howard wins that one out. Yeah, because yeah, Iguodala 
awesome, but more role, yeah, like role guy after his, you know, all star year. But there, but sure, uh, you can hear people say, like, oh, I would rather have Andre Iguodala for my team, but yeah, if you're talking about career, yeah, yeah, likely give it to Dwight Howard, yeah, um, you know, like, especially like when you talk about peak, yeah, it takes um, another peak like Dwight Howard any day because, yeah, he's the center you build your team or you know, Orlando tried, so that's Dwight Howard, right. and they did all right. Yeah. Um, One finals ain't, ain't bad, but. Yeah. So at number four, um, I think he's like a tier below the top three, but his peak was incredibly high. Unfortunately, it was like pretty much only to the first round of the NBA playoffs. That's the saddest part of his career. Yeah. And I don't think you can blame him for that. Um, but yes, Tracy McGrady, who was one of the best players in the NBA for a really long period of time. Um, he goes to Mount Zion Prep, uh, is originally from Florida. Uh, oh, it was called My Mount Zion Christian Academy at the time. And we, we talked about him on our Late Bloomers episode as well. So. Yes. Yeah. The guy who just like rises up. The high school yeah. All of a sudden in the gym, and, people are like, who is this kid? And Rick Pitino takes the head coaching job. Um, I, like, I guess it was down to like Kentucky, Florida State for Tracy. And I, I think he was likely going to go to Kentucky. And Rick Pitino takes the, the job. Tracy McGrady ends up declaring for the NBA draft. Um, Boston has two first round picks. And Rick Pitino, I think, had the GM job. Like, yeah, he was, he was coach. He was yeah. coach GM. He was doing everything. And um, so, yeah, choosing his own players. He takes Chauncey Billups number three, which is a good pick. Good pick. In uh, fact, at the time, Boston really yeah. didn't utilize him, so it kind of looked busty at, the, at that. Well, that, that, that for sure. That for sure. And the sixth pick, he goes with his guy. Except that guy's not Tracy McGrady. It's Ron Mercer. Ron Mercer, Ron Mercer. yeah. Tracy McGrady ends up having this, like, way higher ceiling. I think the Raptors were like incredibly interested in drafting a Donald Foyle as well, who goes one pick before Tracy McGrady. Um, they luck out at least because those first few years in Toronto were a lot of fun. He has a pretty slow start, um, you know, doesn't play like huge minutes, but still averages like seven points per game as a rookie. And like the, the team was still quite bad. He, he, has the, he has the flashes though, especially like he was a pretty good shot blocker for, for a small. Oh, definitely. For Just small. athleticism. But yeah, you, you call him a small forward and he's like 6'8", like 6'9". <laughs> like he was crazy. <laughs> like Tracer Gary was like a tall guy. Yeah. He's like a little skinny. Yeah. Right? He wasn't going to go in the post either, you know, like at that, yeah. that Just time. Just an absurd athlete. Yeah. Crazy athlete. Insane ball skills and movement. Like kind of like does that like James Harden role in Houston before James Harden even gets there? And then, you know, like the, I would say the golden years of Tracy Gray were his years in Orlando where they do have a few years where they're kind of bad, but they have a few years where they, uh, you know, at least have a chance to make it out of the first round of the playoffs and almost get there. He does take it to seven games um, and they lose to Detroit, but yeah, man, like that's crazy. They, they lose to Detroit, and that was like a year where Detroit um, – it was the year before Detroit actually won the, the championship. But, yeah, Tracy McGrady, like, if you look at some of his, like, playoff averages and everything like that, like, that, that's the thing. Like, I'm like, what more could he do? <laughs> he kind of came to Orlando. Well, obviously, like, that was his home, and he got paid tons of it. But he also came out of that, like, a little bit of the falsy pretense of, like, they are also going to have Grant Hill. Yeah, that, that, that was the run with that you know, unfortunately, injuries never allowed for that. Yes, yes, that, like having those two guys play together would have been just a fantastic thing. And I, I think most people felt like Grant Hill was like likely going to be like the man for Orlando. Um, had been an MVP candidate like many times before that. You had these like versatile wing creators that I think any team would love and Orlando had two of them and Grant Hill just unfortunately like has 
huge injury issues as soon as he gets there. The other thing they were talking about, because they were in the same draft, and I think in a redraft, you likely take Tracy McGrady second, but the player that had come out of that draft was Tim Duncan. And they talked about Tim Duncan possibly going to Orlando. Oh, yeah, Orlando had that cap space. Play with Tracy McGrady and play with Grant Hill. Um, yeah, that would have been. It was yeah, it was a three. It was a, those yeah, there was a three that they had cap space that they were trying to plan plan around, and obviously, Tim Duncan stays, and then Orlando yeah. gets Grant Hill, but it's just not, you know, he really doesn't get to play like I think he plays like a year or two, not even, and before he kind of like moves to Phoenix, but Grant Hill recovers his career a little bit. Yeah, Tracy McGrady was kind of left with a lot of nothing around him. He has seven straight all-star appearances where he, like, that is obviously his prime. And he is, I would say, like, a top five to ten best player in the NBA for, um, like, I would say almost all of those years. Um, and, yeah, like, he has some really fun years, has that, the moment that everybody re remembers is when he scored, like, 13 points in like no time <laughs> and uh yeah just an absurd scorer fantastic passer it could hold his own on the defensive end as well um yeah just ridiculous like offensive creation from Tracy McGrady um and a really really fun player and as we alluded to now he's now he's an agent with Jermaine O'Neal he did a great job on ESPN on the jump but he left that to to start this agency up with Jermaine O'Neal, they're off, off to a good good start there. They're both two super seem like they seem like they know what they're doing there. Yes, indeed. But for me, T Mac, it always comes down to it's like I would have loved for him to stay in Toronto. <laughs> with yeah, Gibbs. that's, and that's like what you one, about a lot as well. Yeah, that's the one thing that gets talked about a ton because yeah, he was really he was coming on. Vince was, you know. Already, already at an okay level, you know, still pretty they were close. Man. Yeah, they were all close. That was the other thing. So, yeah, that was, uh, and, you know, they had changed the rule to the point where Vince Carter is a restricted free agent and Tracy McGrady was not. Um, and yeah, like, I, I think the only way that Toronto could have kept Tracy McGrady was if they, like, he was a restricted free agent. Free agent, yeah. Was, was it, not the case. <laughs> the Toronto at the time didn't have the, the ability to really like draw, yeah. draw in and, and retain, but yeah, Luna, I think he always wanted to go home. Yeah, and he just like and, Vince likely did as well. <laughs> yeah, Vince later later would, would make that that same that same move, but that is the the troubled history of the Raptors that I'm sure we could we can get into at a at a later time, but. Number three, again, like so, Tracy McGrady's kind of kind of there. He's like head of Dwight. Number three. Now we're kind of really getting into some of the 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 prime big dogs here. We got Kevin Garnett, the big ticket himself. Yeah. Out of Farragut Academy in Illinois, but originally from South Carolina, they they moved him out to Chicago for his high school. And I know for him, the like the the legend of his you know ascension because he was really the first guy that started this era of, of people going from high school to the NBA was mm -hmm. when he was in Chicago, he went to work out at some place where the Bulls would like Michael Jordan, Scotty, all those guys would go work out. He went there and Isaiah Thomas was also in town and around and said, Hey, you could play in the NBA. And Kevin Gordon's like, Oh, cool. That'd be something I look forward to. And he's like, no, you can do that. Like today, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like right, right at this moment, you could go play in the NBA. And he's like, that's what kind of, you know, got him, got him on there because yeah, it hadn't been done, you know, it, conceptually it had not been done. And um, we talked a little bit about how like absurd, like the top five picks in 1995 were, like they were all really, they all end up being really good players. Kevin Garnett, of course, like head and shoulders above the rest of them. And I know that Isaiah Thomas was like just dreaming of Kevin Garnett dropping to number seven. Oh, just, yeah, two uh, spots, two spots. Yeah, because, uh, you know, it was the wonderful thing where the NBA decided to give the expansion. The two Memphis Canadian teams. Or, uh, sorry, I hate myself for saying Memphis. Vancouver Grizzlies and, um, and Toronto Raptors, the sixth and seventh spot right after Kevin Garnett got drafted. So they end up taking 
Bryant, Big Country, Reeves, and Damon Stoudemire, who are both good players. Damon was rookie of the year. Some of my favorite players. So yeah. Definitely. It worked, worked out well for him. Uh, it did work out well. was a lot of fun. Kevin Garnett, in the long term, I think uh, that would have been pretty sweet. Would have also been nice. <laughs> after, I'm not, not, not going to lie. Kevin Garnett is an all-timer. He is uh, one of, like, the, I would say, you know, 25 or so best players in NBA history um, and has a number of fantastic years for Minnesota. Um, they do also make the NBA Western Conference Finals. I believe it was in 2002, 2003. Um, when he made, them, he made them a playoff team. You know, like he took a team yeah. that was perpetually the lottery and turned it around. Well, they had been like an expansion team. Yeah, like they, he finally – they got to the playoffs. Um, and uh, yeah, he does that with Stefan Marbury uh, in his second season and uh, like quickly becomes an NBA all-star, uh, shows some great flashes even as a, a rookie as well. I think, the, uh, I think the second half of his rookie year, he really like started getting yeah. on the climb. You can see he was getting more comfortable. And then his next year was just like off and yeah. to the running end. And people used to also say about him, you know, that he was kind of like, again, because he was a different player than a lot at the time because he was skinnier, but tall. And he used to say he was six foot 12 because he didn't want to be listed at like seven foot because he was kind of in that that 6'11 yeah. to like some people said he'd grown and been, been a little taller, but was, yeah, just a really different player. He was like a lanky guy, but he was so freaking strong. Like he, that, just like the wiry strength is yeah. what I call it. And he um, spends a number of years leading the NBA in rebounds. He's one of, I would say, like one of the most versatile and fantastic defensive players in NBA history. Uh, could guard so many different positions and just like uh, when, when they do get to Boston, like they have that tremendous defense. And I felt like he was like the heart and soul of that NBA champion. And like, to me, he was the finals MVP. And I, I know he was like even up for possibly winning the NBA MVP that season when um, they win the championship. But uh, he w does win an NBA MVP award as well. Um, yeah, just could do like almost everything on the floor. Uh, <laughs> like this new brand of player where I like, I, I don't know if you, I think there are like some old pictures of him standing next to people who are like supposedly his height, like you mentioned earlier with like the six foot 12 thing. Like, yeah. I think he's like seven one, man. Yeah, because his height <laughs> was always like, was always like fluctuated of like- He's like Kevin Durant, like, yeah, just crazy tall. And his like athleticism, agility, and um, just like, like motor, honestly. I, I, I usually say like, very few people in the NBA have bad motors. Like it's a league where you have to play hard, yeah, yeah. but nobody really played as hard as this guy. Yeah, and he he's was, crazy. He was gonna let you. He was gonna let you know about it as well. <laughs> that too. That too. He did become. Uh, he he went from being like the energetic kid to like the curmudgeonly old man. Was, yeah, like towards the end of his career, I remember him in Boston a lot. Like kind of in the, like on the circle, the perimeter there in the high post, just like yelling, <laughs> like just complaining. Yeah. but he uh yeah D a tremendous nba career and uh he's like i i would say i i was talking about this the other day with uh, a friend but um just in terms of like the stretch for like th that that kind of mold you, you in 1995 you you have um kevin garnett and rashid wallace to come in i would say um in 93 you have chris weber um, and then like, I, I'm almost thinking, but he was, he was more of a center, but like Derek Coleman was kind of like in that yeah, mold as well. Um, uh, like, you know, the guy ball also skill, like, yeah. not only that, like, yeah, have ball skills can stretch out and are great passers as well. Um, but yeah, like Kevin Garnett, certainly similar to that. I think I read in Wikipedia and I, I looked up like the article is, uh, Kevin Garnett said a lot of people thought he, he loved the Fab Five, like he really looked up to Chris Weber. And many thought that if he went to college, he would have gone to Michigan. And he said he would have shocked the world and went to Maryland. Um, so who knows what would have happened there. The 
other word was that he had like SAT issues, even though his grades were good enough. Um, and then apparently his SATs were like fine, but he had already decided to enter. Regardless, Kevin Garnett has um, is the earned the second most out of just pure NBA salary um, in history. Uh, now behind LeBron James because he really signed one of the first like fat con like hundred million dollar. Yeah. But and, and then it's funny because when we talk about these like the first year of guaranteed contracts, his first year's salary was one point six two million dollars, which like is now barely yeah, like above, above minimum. the NBA minimum. So that's just how much things have changed from that time. But yeah, Kevin Garnett, um, a player that I think anybody would want and would be like a phenomenal uh, five in terms of the NBA and like somebody that, you know, you would be fine playing at four or five. And yeah, he's a, a player that is cross-generationally cross generationally great. No, I definitely I'd go back, go back and watch some. Yeah. Some oh, man. Yeah. Watch on Catch Gems. We'll see a few highlights there. <laughs> and at number two, now we have like the top two. This is going to be going to be some debate. There will be. Um, I am at the point of my life and uh, secure enough in this to say that if you're debating this, then you're probably just not right. And uh, I, number two, I, I do have Kobe Bryant. And there, there was a time where I think there was a debate. I, I think that that debate has passed. Um, of course, you know, we were just like, oh, the passing of Kobe Bryant was uh, a low point, I think, for a lot of people when that happened. Um, I guess almost like, or has it been two years? It's been a year. It was February. Of 2020. Oh man, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gosh, yeah. So it was right before the pandemic. Yeah. Um, what was it like? It was like end of January. January uh, yeah, beginning of February. I, God, I can't believe it. Though. Pand the pandemic's made everything just. Yes, you know, but you know. but Kobe, you look at it, you look at his career. Obviously, he's got his thing of basically, the Lakers loved his workout. They wanted him. He did not want to go to Charlotte. He was Jerry West guy. But it's crazy because again, he's the 13th, and this was a super strong draft. So I'm not going to take away, you know, away some of these guys, but he was the, the 13th pick in the, the draft. Yes, this was at a time, and, and that's why I gave the disclaimer at the beginning. I don't think they had any idea what to do with high school players uh, in 1996. Because again, he's a hot, he's a, he's a big, big scorer. He's not going to come to the NBA and, and do that, right? Yes. You know, it's like, yeah, he will. So, you know, obviously, like, Allen Iverson goes number one in that draft. Um, Understandable. Kobe, Kobe Bryant, I think you undoubtedly take him number one in a redraft. You may even take, like, Steve Nash over Allen Iverson. I know that might be sacrilegious to some, but it's at least a discussion. But, yes, Kobe Bryant. It depends from the perspective of, like, yeah, like, if you're, like, a GM and you, you think about, like, sculpting a team. Yeah. Not to mention like Ray Allen being in that draft as well. Um, but yes, Kobe Bryant, the, the top five picks are all like really good players. You have Anton Walker going number six. Then you have Lorenzo Wright was a good, like, you know, rebounding center. Um, Kerry Kittles, who was pretty good out of Villanova. Then Samaki Walker. Ends up becoming Kobe's teammate. Becoming a teammate later on. Uh, Eric Dampier. Todd Fuller goes number 11 to the Golden State Warriors. I think they all remember that one. And um, Vitaly Potapenko, who um, is the 12th pick by the Cleveland Cavaliers right before you get a string of three unreal players in yeah. Kobe Bryant, Peja Stojakovic, and Steve Nash. Yeah. So yeah, just absolutely crazy. Kobe was considered like um if he wasn't the best player in his high school class he was at least considered one of them i i think most people had kobe ranked number one 
um, you could see like the scoring talent just pretty immediately. And uh, did he win? No, he wasn't McDonald's All-American MVP. He did win Naismith Prep Player of the Year. Um, he was a fourth team parade All-American as a junior and was first team as a senior. Um, and then immediately comes into the NBA and is getting rotation minutes for a Lakers team that just signed Shaquille O'Neal. Um, is that his second year he makes an all-star team without being... <laughs> without starting? starting. Yeah, he starts on the all-star team without <laughs> starting for his own team. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, like fairly immediately is uh, a the second best player on an NBA championship team. And there was there was a period too, like it, like early in his Lakers career too, where Shaq's hurt and Kobe just like goes on this tear. Yes. Yeah. Kobe would have many seasons where he went on absolute scoring tears. And obviously uh, 81 points in a game, you know, that's something we... Four times leads the NBA in points, twice leads it in points per game. And usually when you're talking about like the players of certain generations, you go, you're talking about like, you know, Michael Jordan, uh, Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, like that. that's like the generation there. And obviously there are like, you know, Shaquille O'Neal, Tim Duncan, like players along the way as well. But yes, I like, it's really hard to take away what Kobe Bryant did it's also, his NBA career. It's um, also crazy to look at him. I don't know if everybody has him in their top 10, but I think he's top 15. And uh, if you have him like lower than 20, then you probably have issues. Only only one, <laughs> only one MVP too is always, is always hard. Yeah, like, and it, hard like, that year I know it, it, like, it seemed like it was pretty obvious at the time Kobe was going to win it. Um, I thought in 2006, he certainly had a discussion because of the lack of help he had on his team. And then he almost beat the player who ends up beating him out for MVP. He came fourth in voting in 2006. Like their team wasn't very good, but he just had like this incredible year um, and has a number of incredible years and uh, does eventually of course, wins the three NBA championships with Shaquille O'Neal and eventually gets enough of a team where he can uh, just be the anchor and uh, wins a couple more championships in um, Yeah, I think, I think you, look, you look at those. And, you know, 2010. Of, of, yeah, Kobe, Pow, and then you had Bynum in the low post, like Kobe doing his thing yeah. out on the perimeter. You had Pow in the high post. And low Lamar post. Odom. Yeah. You had Trevor Reza for one. You had uh, Matt Ron Artest. Um, yeah, the, they, they had some teams. And Derek Fisher, I think, uh, still being – was Derek Fisher still part of it? I believe so. Or had he, he moved on by that point? No, he was still there. Because he came back – well, he left the Lakers and then came back like, prior to that. Yeah. So, but yeah. I definitely – yeah, no, Kobe's one of the great killer instinct players. For sure. Of all the mentality. Time. Score in so many different ways. Intensity, yeah. I don't know if people made like, yes, like Kobe like took tough shots, but his ability to like consistently make ridiculously tough looks was unreal. Um, it develops like this, you know, obviously kind of like mirroring Michael Jordan like post game as well. Uh, becomes a fantastic defender also. Um, yeah, he's one of the best players in NBA history. And um, he is, so yeah, it's crazy. So with our top three players, and I think it's pretty obvious who our number one player is going to be, um, Kobe Bryant has made the third most in NBA history. It, I, it will be surpassed by Chris Paul. But um, yeah, up to this point, like the three Highest paid players based on NBA salary in the history of this league uh, were all players that went uh, prep to pro. And all had and all had really long careers. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, I, I think all of them at one point in their career, maybe except Kevin Garnett, um, who still had a really long career, uh, have played in the NBA like over half of their lives. Yeah. Like, that's insane. <laughs> yeah. LeBron, like LeBron's reached that point. No, 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 totally. Yeah. But he's yeah he's or he's, he's getting to that point. 
But he's also getting to the point where people have played against him, have children, the children are now going to, you know, high school, college, and like he's like crossing generations. <laughs> like he's getting to the point where he, he plays with his own son. Yeah. His kid is going to be a junior in high school next year. Yeah. Like, crazy. Yeah. So if, if they brought back Raptor Pro or, or not, I mean, that's two, you know, two, three years. I mean, theoretically, it, it could happen, obviously. A lot of variable, but moving on to our number one player, that is right. There's been a lot of debate, but it is, <laughs> it's Darius Miles. That God, yeah. LeBron James would be the number one player. Darius Miles would be a 1.5, 1A. Darius Miles that's high. I remember uh, people even, amazingly enough, LeBron James, as a rookie, plays on the same team as Darius as Miles. Cleveland. And Dewan Wagner. Who wasn't a prep to pro, but you know, a one year, like a one year call. A guy you you would hope the sky was the limit for. Um, but yes, LeBron James is, I think, not only the number one prep to pro, but I I think uh, like on most people's NBA all time Mount Rushmore, um, at least most top five lists, and I would think most are a lot of people. A great number of people likely feel that LeBron James is, if not the best player to play in NBA history, the second best player to play in NBA history. Um, just incredible longevity. Like if there are like three guys who like have that level of dominance and like longevity and like individual dominance, um, it's Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Michael Jordan, LeBron James. And yeah, LeBron James, um, the amazing thing, like, over his high school career, I, I wanted to look up, make sure I, I knew his high school record at St. Vincent St. Mary, and it was 101 and 6. Absolutely crazy. When he was, he, and he was the... Definitely highly suggest you watch more than a game also. Yeah, LeBron James, like, as... A freshman, I remember hearing about him because it was so rare to see freshmen be honorable mention on Slam All Americans, and LeBron James was an honorable mention on Slam. Well, that's why Slam Slam was on him. Slam Magazine was yeah. very high on him for a very very long time. I mean, then he hits a Sports Illustrated cover. Well, he's, he's still in high school. And... I believe that was his junior season, or like. Well, because he has he has the cover. He has the one cover too with Sebastian Telfair. I remember that one. On Slam. Yeah. Yeah. On Slam and then Sports Illustrated. He I, saw, I don't think yes, I was putting Sebastian on the cover. No, no, no. no. Well, no they were bold no. enough to do that. I think they might have made a cover or had a big story. I remember they did do a big story on Sebastian Telfair. Uh, uh, in SI? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That very well could be. I don't think he made the cover, but yeah. I don't yeah, know. I don't, I'd, have to, I'd have to double check on that. But, but yeah, like LeBron just, and again, so much, this is pre, you know, the pre YouTube. But this is the most like he's getting his games on ESPN. That hadn't really happened for you know for high school guys. Everybody knew teams were tanking. Yeah, you know to try to try to get a you chance. You didn't know Kwame Brown was going to go number one. You, I guess you knew like I, it was, yeah. You you knew a high school player was going to go number one in two thousand one. You weren't sure it was Kwame Brown up until like the little process before the draft you knew lebron james was going to go number one in 2003 <laughs> you absolutely knew and um yeah he wins rookie of the year uh it is like a battle between he and carmelo anthony who has a fantastic rookie season as well and leads his team to the playoffs but lebron averages 20.9 points per game 5.9 assists 5.5 rebounds um was at least an all-star consideration and, and that's his lowest scoring year in his career. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that. And then uh, I think Zydrunas Algauskas makes the All-Star team during his... Yeah, he did. He made that the first year. because Absolutely absurd. Um, <laughs> because, yeah, LeBron James, clearly the best player immediately there. But um, I mean, still, 17 times NBA All-Star. Yeah. Doesn't make the um, playoffs in his first two seasons... And then up until his first year with Los Angeles, uh, that never happens again. And then, of course, he has made the NBA Finals in 
10 of his 17 seasons. Uh, and then like, I, he's never lost in the first round. That's the other amazing thing. Um, yeah. yeah, just absurd longevity. Um, and really this is the first year of season he's actually missed, you know, a, a, well, his first year with the Lakers, but this, this is yeah. like the other year he's really missed significant portions of, you know, he's played you know, had a hundred game season, you know, between regular season, preseason playoffs. Yeah. And he's still not, not showing signs of slowing down, you know, like, like he was, yeah. The fact that he was like in the MVP conversation at the beginning of the year to the point where people were like, Oh, it's like his to lose. And not thinking that like, you know, LeBron James is a human being and uh, could possibly get injured. But yeah, he's um, third all time in NBA points. And we know that Father Time is undefeated, but he looks to at least be in line to possibly be the NBA's all time leading scorer by the time that he's done his career. Um, yeah, just crossing our fingers. Um, but yeah, he. Uh, his achievements pretty incredible four-time MVP uh, has been like in the MVP like conversation a number of years has finished like runner-up or one of the top vote getters in MVP um, and then the other thing is playoff LeBron and <laughs> like the level he gets to in the NBA playoffs is absolutely absurd um, has a few, I think, of the more impressive like NBA Finals performances ever. Does have a few of the moments where you know he uh, had a few stumbles like in uh, 2010, 2011. But yeah, after he wins his first NBA championship, it's been pretty spectacular. Um, and yeah, one of the better careers in NBA history. Lived up to everything, and. Uh, I think he's clearly the best prep to pro of all time. And that would include Moses Malone as well. And I, I, I would say that Moses Malone is a player who um, you likely, you know, talk about with uh, just, like, I don't know. I, I think it's like almost like a conversation between Moses Malone and Kevin Garnett um, because Moses Malone was a really fantastic player, but yeah, like LeBron, Kobe, I think are, are clearly the the top two. Yeah, like the the high elite. Yeah, of it, but you know, just to give some honorable, you know, other other guys that you know were in contention. You definitely got your, you know, Andrew Bynum, who had it, who had his high, but unfortunately, you know, longevity wasn't wasn't there for him. But you know, few, those few years on the Lakers, he did make an All Star team and was really a solid contributor on the the championship teams. You got Al Harrington, Al Jefferson, Monte Ellis. Those are really. Yeah, the Ellis certainly had a, a number of really good years. Um, as, as far as like some guys who added to championship teams, um, Jared Smith when he was with the Cleveland Cavaliers, and uh, then another time when he was with the Cleveland Cavaliers, he wanted to rip his head off. <laughs> but, um, yeah, he had LeBron had a, as a, you know what he ended up back on the Lakers last year, so you know. Did did yeah, and I'm, I'm guessing LeBron signed off on him and wanted to have him around. Um, Kendrick and then Gerald Green, like Josh yeah. Outlaw, I think had a you know few decent decent years. And as we mentioned, um, Sean Livingston, who yeah. I think was a excellent role player on uh, the Golden State Warriors when they won championships, and um, was like really good with like Brooklyn, with Milwaukee, like a number of teams. Sean Livingston was like he was a bench player. I think so many teams would. Died to have no, totally. And again, bigger. I got with like wing size and hard skills. Yeah, no, def definitely. But yeah, that's um, that is our list. If you have any debate, if you think that Kobe is above LeBron, you think LeBron, Kobe, Kevin Garnett, you think anyone should be in a different position, drop us a comment. Yes. Uh, let us know if there's any high school guy that you think we missed out on. If you think really, you know, hey, Darius Miles, he was better than Lou Williams in some hypothetical universe. <laughs> Go be, go be your crazy self and drop, drop us a comment. You can also send us an email, vislandpod at gmail.com. If you're watching us on YouTube, hit us a like, smash that subscribe button, smash it. I want your mouse to not work. 
if you're on iTunes, SoundCloud, listening to our podcast, you know, definitely give us a review, share it out. We definitely appreciate all that love. If you want to follow us together, you love, you love the duo, you love what we're doing, that's at Viseland. If you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at Jay Weisenberg. You want to follow Michael on Twitter, that is at NBA Draft Mikey V. Mikey, anything else to send us home with? Thank you so much for all the new subscribers. For anybody that's shot a like on one of our videos, we greatly appreciate it. And thank you for listening to what I believe, Jason, is a year of Visland episodes. I think we're at 51. Let me, I will, double we? That, but we will have a 52 celebration. Yeah. Cool, cool. 50, I believe it's 51, but yeah. either way. I may, I may have counted wrong, but yeah, it, we're, we're really close. close. So Whatever you know, it is, we're really close. We're definitely going to celebrate that with, with everybody, but thank you guys so much, and we will catch you next week.